Do at least one exercise a year, a scenario in which Fort Knox, the gold vault, is attacked. I think a terrorist would be pretty foolish to try and take on a, an army base like Fort Knox. The Mint Police protect the vault grounds. Outside their guard towers and barbed wire perimeter, the Army's military police are on patrol. Every person, every tourist, every worker, every journalist approaching the vault is treated as a potential threat, as our crew discovered. It's not a joking matter to these people. They take their jobs very, very seriously. I wouldn't want to push my luck. I do not know of a shoot-to-kill order on the fence, but I might be wrong. You try hopping over that fence and running towards there, call the coroner. No. I believe they'd shoot you. The need for a heavily protected gold vault grew out of the gathering storm clouds of the 30s. It was a time of great civil unrest because of the Depression. Franklin Roosevelt outlawed the owning of gold in the United States. People had to turn in all their gold, and it was melted down. These coins were molded into gold bullion and transported to the basement of the Federal Reserve in New York City. During this same period, Hitler and Mussolini were rising to power in Europe. The invasion of U.S. cities was a palpable threat. Gold became the most valuable currency in a troubled world. America needed a secure place, safe from foreign attack. And in Kentucky, out near the Indiana border, the U.S. Army had amassed the most technologically advanced fighting force of its time, the all-new armored mechanized cavalry. If you look at pre-World War II United States, this was the biggest military base in the country, and it was located on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains from the coastal states, so that was determined to be the best place to store the gold. An intense construction project began. Workers hauled some 16,000 cubic feet of granite to the site. 4,200 cubic yards of concrete were poured over 750 tons of reinforcing steel and 670 tons of structural steel. The building is only 105 by 120 feet wide and 42 feet high. By the time construction was complete in December of 1936, the project had cost over $560,000. That's more than six and a half million dollars today, the equivalent of just 56 gold bars. In January of 1937, the first gold arrived from the Federal Reserve in New York and the Mint in Philadelphia. In its well-guarded vaults are stored millions in gold bullion and silver bars. Frequently, the passers-by stop to watch the careful transfer of precious metal. Great quantities are received, and Uncle Sam takes no chances. It is handled with military discipline. I was inside the railroad track in Fort Knox. To move it off the train, they had a flatbed outfit there, and they had guards, of course, going along to see if it got there all right. Well, it was quite a sight to see them on those flat cars with the bullion blocks ricked up on those flatbed trucks. It was quite a sight. The vibration on the trucks moving to the gold vault, they thought they might have lost a little of the gold and they weighed it before they deposited it in the depository. Say Fort Knox, and the first thing most Americans think of is gold. But decades before Midas touched this patch of Kentucky bluegrass, Uncle Sam had staked his claim. From the beginning, the armored might of the U.S. Army has protected the gold at Fort Knox. Legendary warriors from Patton to Schwarzkopf have been part of the force as they passed through training and command duties at this home of the armored cavalry. Military history in this region dates back to the Civil War. 
There was no training camp here until World War I. In 1918, the Army leased 10,000 acres for an artillery range and named it after General Henry Knox, George Washington's chief of artillery in the Revolutionary War. In time, Fort Knox became home to the cavalry. Mechanizing the Army, replacing horses and wagons with cars and trucks and tanks, began a technological revolution of the U.S. Army. Camp Knox was created when we decided to mechanize the Army. We bought the first equipment here. You know, we had the sorrowful events of people having to give up their horses and then come here, uh, get on armored cars and equipment. Fort Knox has always been an intellectual center for mounted warfare. The idea that we were going to have to mechanize the Army had been intellectually discussed through the 20s. And then suddenly we were really having to struggle with putting theory to practice. In the 1930s, as war again erupted in Europe, the Germans shocked the world with their bold, innovative use of tank warfare. In 1940, the U.S. responded by creating the Armored Force to be headquartered at Fort Knox. The Armored Force School and the Armored Force Replacement Center were at the forefront of U.S. efforts to prepare for a revolutionary new style of mounted warfare. Mounted warfare is harder. It moves faster. You have to think at the speed of the vehicle. You have to think about the depth of the enemy. You have to determine different conditions. I mean, all those things were new. And the experimentation in the building really began here. <laughs> When the U.S. entered World War II, the armored school burgeoned both in size and importance. By 1943, there were 700 officers and 3,500 enlisted men at the school. By the end of World War II, the armored force included 16 armored divisions. There were 100 tank battalions and mechanized cavalry squadrons. Fort Knox's tankers were key to America's success in North Africa and Europe. When the war was over, the need to have an armored force within the Army stayed, so this remained an intellectual center for a whole new way of training and a whole new way of fighting mounted combat. Fort Knox is the center of armored training for the new millennium. The remote-controlled, computerized, digitized battlefield is something that General Henry Knox could never have dreamed of.